Rodney Alcala, also known as the Dating Game Killer, was famous for being a brutal murderer who once appeared on the network game show The Dating Game. Alcala was one of the deadliest serial killers in American history, and his appearance on The Dating Game was basically just a footnote to the gruesome legacy he's left behind. When he appeared on the show, he was already on the FBI's radar. He had previously been arrested multiple times for violent crimes against women and had done time for these crimes in the California state prison system. The fact that he was able to get onto a national game show is a sobering reminder of just how difficult it used to be to track down truly dangerous people before criminal records were digitized and networked. By the time he appeared on The Dating Game, Rodney Alcala had already killed at least four innocent people. He was a charismatic, handsome, charming young man who claimed to be a fashion photographer to lure his victims back to his home. While no one is certain how many people he killed, the authorities estimate the number to be as high as 130 he displayed all of the warning signs of a killer. Most details on Alcala's childhood are fairly scarce. We know, however, he was born in Texas in 1943 and given the name Rodrigo Jacques Alcala Bucor. When he was still very young, Alcala's family relocated to Mexico. When he was 11, his father abandoned his family. It was then Alcala's mother packed the family up and moved them to Los Angeles. When he was 17, he joined the army and worked as a clerk for four years until he went AWOL. After abandoning his duties, Alcala paid a surprise visit to his mother at her home in LA. During his stint in the army, Alcala was accused of sexual misconduct. After being diagnosed by a military psychologist, he was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder and discharged on medical grounds. Hey, if you're enjoying this video so far, be sure to give it a like and subscribe to Factsverse if you haven't already. And keep watching to learn how justice finally caught up with Rodney Alcala. Alcala's first victim survived his attack. The first act of violence committed by Alcala that we have documentation of occurred in 1968 in Hollywood. Tali Shapiro, an eight-year-old girl, was minding her own business while walking to school when Alcala noticed her and coaxed her into his vehicle. At one of his trials, Shapiro testified about all she could remember from the incident. She revealed she was suspicious of him at first, but he managed to convince her he was a family friend and wanted to show her a picture. Once she was in his car, he took her back to his apartment. Shapiro luckily doesn't recall the details of the actual attack, which is probably a good thing. Thankfully, someone witnessed her getting into Alcala's car and became concerned the vehicle didn't have any plates. That witness proceeded to follow the car and called law enforcement to give them the location. If it wasn't for that good Samaritan, Shapiro presumably would have been killed. When the cops showed up and knocked on his door, Alcala was still at the apartment. He tried to stall for a minute, but the officers kicked in his door. To their horror, they found Tali Shapiro lying naked in a pool of blood on the floor. Alcala had sexually assaulted and beaten Tali with a metal bar. Unfortunately, he didn't experience any consequences for his actions that day as he somehow managed to escape out the back door. Shapiro recovered from her attack and remains the only one of his victims to survive. Because the attacker fled the scene, the Shapiro family were afraid he would come back to finish what he started, so they moved out of the country. He made the FBI's most wanted list. After Rodney Alcala's attack of Tali Shapiro, he was placed on the FBI's infamous most wanted list. Without any of the authorities catching wind of his plans, Alcala fled California and made his way to the East Coast, where he changed his name to John Berger. In the 70s, it was easier to do things like that since background checks were fairly limited. He lived as John Berger for many years. Under that name, he went to film school at NYU and studied under Roman Polanski. It was in Manhattan that he committed his first known murder, although you should keep in mind the majority of his crimes aren't documented, so he may have already killed one or more people by that time. In 1971, Cornelia Crilly was found strangled to death in her apartment. This case unfortunately went cold and wasn't solved for another 40 years. A fingerprint found at the scene of the crime was positively matched to Alcala in 2010. After murdering Crilly, Alcala moved to New Hampshire, where he started working as a summer camp counselor. Three years after he brutally attacked Tali Shapiro, someone finally recognized him. Two girls attending the camp saw the FBI wanted poster at the post office and turned Alcala in. After being arrested, he was sent back to California. There, he would be prosecuted for his attack on Shapiro. Frustratingly, the prosecution was at a disadvantage since the Shapiro family had relocated to Mexico and they refused to allow Tali to testify at Alcala's trial. Without her testimony, the prosecution found it difficult to convict him of attempted murder. Akala ended up pleading guilty to assault and served just under two years before being released on parole. Just two months after he was released, Akala sexually assaulted a 13-year-old girl on her way to school. He was fortunately caught and sent back to prison where he served another two years before being released on parole once again. The Dating Game 
Alcala worked for a while as a typesetter at the LA Times. He also claimed to be a successful photographer and used his sketchy photography business to lure victims back to his house to model for him. He took thousands of pictures, mostly nudes, all of women and teenage boys and girls. In 1978, he made an appearance on the TV show The Dating Game. At the time, he had a rather nasty rap sheet that included rape and assault right there in California, so it's alarming they allowed him on the show in the first place. But no one apparently bothered to check his background, and being the charming man he was, he managed to win the game. The Bachelorette was a woman named Cheryl Bradshaw, and while Alcala managed to swoon her on camera, she never actually went out with him afterwards. Once the cameras were no longer rolling, Alcala showed his true colors. When Bradshaw spoke with him backstage, she reportedly found him creepy and refused to go on a date with him. One of the other suitors who appeared alongside Alcala, Jed Mills, likewise noted he was very obnoxious and creepy. The law finally caught up with him. Alcala's appearance on the dating game was in 1978. A year later, while he was on a beach in Huntington Beach, California, he approached a 12-year-old named Robin Samso and her friend Bridget. Alcala ended up running away when a neighbor walked over to see what he was up to. Robin later left her friend to go to dance class, but sadly this was the last time she was seen alive. The little girl's body was found 40 miles away 12 days after she disappeared. Bridget, Robin's friend, was able to provide the police with a description of the peculiar man who approached them at the beach. The composite sketch she was able to assist in producing was then sent out to police stations throughout the state. Alcala's parole officer saw it and recognized him, and he was promptly arrested. While in jail, Alcala's sister came to pay him a visit. Law enforcement was listening in on their conversation when Alcala asked his sister to clean out a storage unit he had in Seattle. The cops were able to beat Alcala's sister to the locker, and in it, they found a trove of photos he had taken over the years documenting his many crimes. The images were all quite graphic and disturbing, but in that unit they also found a bag of women's earrings. Samso's mother identified one of the earrings as the one her daughter was wearing the day she was abducted. Alcala thus was found guilty of Samso's murder and sentenced to death. The wheels of justice turned slowly. By 1980, after being tried, convicted, and sentenced to death, the verdict was overturned by the California Supreme Court because jurors had been improperly informed of his prior sex crimes. In 1986, a second trial took place that was essentially a repeat of the first one, except for the omission of the prior criminal record testimony. He was found guilty again and sentenced to death. A Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals panel, however, nullified the second conviction because a witness was not allowed to support Alcala's contention that the park ranger who discovered Samso's body had been hypnotized by police investigators. In 2003, prosecutors proposed the Samso charges be combined with those of Alcala's four other known victims. In March 2010, he was sentenced to death for the third time. In 2012, he was indicted in New York for the 1971 slaying of Cornelia Crilly and the 77 killing of Ellen Jane Hover. After he was extradited, he pled guilty and was sentenced to 25 years to life in 2013. While awaiting his death sentence, he died at age 77 of unspecified natural cause in Corcoran, California on July 24, 2021, 42 years after he was apprehended. Now it's time to hear from you. What should we do with people like Alcala? Should we lock them up and throw away the key or execute them to serve as an example? Let us know in the comments section below. And before you go, make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to Facts First if you haven't already. Click the bell icon to stay updated on all our latest content.